we started out by a quick poll question um, this morning, and um, it's what are the three main outcomes of complement activation? And I see all the three major ones here. And the one that we put in the most, you know, gets bigger. That's the way this word cloud thing works. kind of cool. Um, so opsonization is definitely one of them. Um, inflammation is uh, a second one. And uh, lysis of uh, foreign cells is another one. I kind of see that one there. Um, it's kind of written a different way, <laughs> right? Um, remember, heat and swelling are associated with inflammation, so those would be somewhat uh, acceptable as well. Uh, fever is not an outcome of um, complement activation. Um, so let's see. Okay. So pretty good start. So let's go over to our PowerPoint that we were still working on last time. And I'm actually going to plug in if I can find it. So we have a couple more of those we're going to do, so don't put your phones away, away. Uh, I need this one. So where is it? There it is. Right. So um, inflammation, opsonization, and lysis of foreign cells. Right. And so we looked at this last time. Right. Two of the major um, complement proteins are important for inflammation: C3A and C5A. And then C3B is the opsonizer. It's the one that actually binds to the foreign cells and the phagocytic cells. Grab onto it. Opsonization, I always think of it as tagged for destruction, right? Because that's what's going to happen to it. It's going to be destroyed by phag phagocytic cells. And then the, the foreign lysis. And remember, this is a membrane attack complex. It makes up several proteins. You don't have to memorize them all. Um, but form that donut-shaped structure. And so gram negatives are really susceptible to this. Do you remember why? What structure are theirs that gets disrupted? No, this is a membrane attack complex. The outer membrane of gram negatives um, gets attacked by uh, the MAC complex. Um, and not so much the gram positives because it's got to get through the cell wall to get to their cell membrane. They don't have two membranes like gram negatives do. So we're going to, so that's, that's what happens. But how does this start, right? How does complement get activated? How do we get the breaking of these proteins into C3A and C3B and C5A and C5B? How does this all start? Right. So that's what we're going to watch right now. Complement consists of a group of serum proteins that activates inflammation, destroys cells, and participates in oxidization. Complement can be activated by a number of different foreign molecules. The complement proteins respond in a sequential manner, producing a cascade of reactions. The major components are C1 through C9, named in the order that they were discovered, not in the order in which they function. The complement cascade can be activated by the classical pathway or by the alternative pathway. In the classical pathway, C1 becomes activated when it binds to an antigen antibody complex. The activated C1 then cleaves C2 into C2A and C2B, and C4 into C4A and C4B. C2B and C4B combine to form a protease called C3 convertase. C3 convertase then cleaves C3 into C3A and C3B. In the alternative <coughs> pathway, Antigens such as endotoxin, polysaccharides, or cell wall components react with C3B. Small amounts of C3A and C3B are constantly being formed from C3, but without activation, they are soon destroyed. C3B reacts with the proteins factor B, factor D, and proparin to form a complex called C3 convertase, which cleaves C3 into C3A and C3B. Both of these pathways of complement activation follow the same sequence after cleavage of C3. C3A is involved in stimulating inflammation. 
C3B reacts with other complement components to form C3 convertase, which forms more C3A and C3B. C3B also attaches to the surfaces of microorganisms. Phagocytes have a binding site for C3B. Therefore, microorganisms with C3B bound to their surfaces are more susceptible to phagocytosis. Coding of bacteria to make them more susceptible to phagocytosis is called optimization. Addition of proparin to C3 convertase results in formation of C5 convertase, which cleaves C5 into C5A and C5B. C5A enhances inflammation and acts as a chemoattractant for phagocytes. C5B reacts with other complement components, including C6, C7, C8, and C9, to form a membrane attack complex. This structure forms a hole in the cell membrane and causes cells to lyse. So as I said last time, the good news is you guys don't have to know every step of this process. It's not a graduate level immunology class. <laughs> I still don't even remember all the steps. The important thing is um, the beginning and the end, right? Um, and, and a general understanding of what happens in the middle. So what happens in the beginning is we got to activate this system, right? And so you saw two of the ways in which we activate. One is referred to as the classical. I want to get to this slide. And so that was antibodies um, interacting with complement proteins after they've already interacted with the antigen, after we have what we refer to as this immune complex. So you have the antibodies binding to some antigen, they're recognizing it, and then the complement proteins interact with those antibodies. And that starts off the cascade of reactions. And as you noticed, um, a major step in that process is this convertase that keeps splitting C3 into C3A and C3B, and then we continue down the process, right? And one of the other major steps is C5 getting split in it into its two components. And um, C5A and C3A, as we said, are really important for the inflammatory response that we'll see. And then C3B, remember, B for binding, this is the one that opsonizes, tags the phagocytic cells, um, tags the pathogens for phagocytic cell destruction. And then um, we can go on with several other of the complement proteins and form the overall MAC complex, which can insert into membranes, right? It's a membrane attack complex. So the other um, pathway they mention is referred to as the alternative pathway. And so these names, too, are kind of somewhat misleading because um, depending on whether you've ever seen this antigen before, chances are if you've never seen it before, you don't have antibodies, right? So it's not the classical um, activation pathway. Right? It's not antibodies binding, activating complement um, that's going to start this cascade of events of inflammation, more opsonization, and maybe um, the MAC complex. Instead, it's probably the alternative pathway. So how or why did he get this name? Well, because obviously they discovered the antibody way of activating complement first. Right? That's why it's called the classical or you could say the first discovered. Uh, and then therefore, alternatively, the alternative pathway was discovered. But probably if it's the very first time we've ever seen a pathogen, it's going to be the alternative pathway of complement that gets activated, not the classical. Okay, And this is because C3 is always getting broken into those two pieces, right? C3A and C3B. And if the C3B binds, then that's going to keep that um, going. It's going to keep that activation going of splitting C3A into C3B. And then we're going to go even further down to um, splitting C5 into its components. So if C3A and C3B are always being produced, how come C3B isn't sticking to our cells? 
That wouldn't be good, right? Do we want it to stick to ourselves and destroy ourselves? No. So we have a regulatory mechanism so that C3B can't bind to our cells and can't activate complement. Otherwise, we, we you know, <laughs> we'd be killing ourselves, right? <laughs> we don't want to attack ourselves. So the one pathway that the animation that we watched didn't go over is the lictin um, binding pathway. So this one here in the middle. So I'm going to back up a slide to this one. Um, so activation requires mannan binding lictins. So um, mannan is a polymer of the sugar mannose, and it's found associated with a lot of microbial cells. Okay. Um, so this is one of those general receptor type things, right? Like how we can detect peptidoglycan. Well, the complement system can detect um, mannan. And so the same thing, we're going we're gonna to activate the cascade of events, right? We're going to get C3 broken into its two pieces. Um, so we're going to elicit inflammation. We're going to further down with C5A and really get the phagocytic cells to the area. We may even opsonize them with C3B, so it makes it easier for the phagocytic cells to recognize and destroy them. And then we may even get the formation of the MAC complex and um, directly insert into the membranes of that pathogen and destroy it. So for host cells, Right, um, C3B is inactivated. Right, so we have regulatory proteins right, that keep it from activating the complement system. But on microbial surfaces, right, um, those those regulatory proteins don't interact. It does bind. It does activate complement. So remember with all of these protection mechanisms we have, we still get sick, right? Um, because there are microbes out there that have found ways to evade detection um, and to utilize basically our system against us. So although I didn't look up a specific example last night, I forgot to. Um, there are some microbes that will, will coat themselves with our own um, complement regulatory proteins and therefore they can stop C3B from binding and becoming activated. Evil. Yeah. <laughs> they use our own system against us. So the next thing that we're going to um, look at is the antiviral activity of interferon. So um, our viral response is a little bit different than how we would respond to, say, invading bacteria. Uh, for the most part, bacteria are going to stay outside of our cells, um, but they may even attach and destroy our cells. Viruses definitely have to get into our cells um, in order to use our cell machinery to copy themselves. So because of that constraint for them, the way that we defend ourselves against them has to be really an internal um, situation. Okay, So think about that as we go through um, this animation, then we'll, we'll walk through it again. When a cell is infected by a virus, the virus enters the cell and produces structures that are not found in uninfected cells. The presence of this viral material signals the cell to produce interferon. The interferon moves out of the cell and attaches to receptors on nearby cells of the same type. The cell that produces the interferon is unable to save itself. The virus replicates in this cell and then moves out to infect nearby cells. The nearby cell that already has interferon bound to its surface responds in several ways, including production of enzymes that degrade messenger RNA and prevent protein synthesis. Thus, a virus can attach and enter the cell, but completion of the viral replication cycle is prevented. 
So it's all about stopping them from using us, right, to copy themselves. There's some sad news in this process, though. So RIG, or, or like receptors, are found in the cytoplasm, and they detect RNA, viral RNA. And they're going to produce interferon. They're basically going to say, I've been attacked. They're going to scream out to their friends, watch out, it might be coming your way next. Right? So obviously you're going to get prepared. Right? If you think the bad guy is coming. So how they're going to get prepared is they're going to cause the cells to express inactive antiviral proteins. So protein kinase, um, and it, uh, uh, RNase, which destroys RNA as you saw in that animation. So once a virus does come, and get into that cell that's already been warned, he's prepared to fight. And so when that virus infects that cell, that, that the cell detects this double-stranded, say, RNA, and that's going to activate those inactive proteins. So it's going to degrade the messenger RNA. So it's going to stop that virus from making its viral proteins. But that cell that's activated those is now going to go through programmed cell death. And part of the reason for that is these enzymes aren't necessarily specific to the virus. They're going to degrade stuff in that cell as well. So basically that cell commits suicide to save all the rest of the cells in the area because he stopped that virus from replicating. So it can't go now and infect other <coughs> cells. Are there ways around this? Of course, right? We, we still get viral infection. Interferon doesn't take care of it all. But it definitely helps us significantly with viral infection. And that's why sometimes, too, you'll hear on TV some of the drugs that they use for certain viral infections, they'll they may even mention doesn't contain interferon, right? Um, but in some cases, you know, they use interferon <coughs> as um, drug treatment. They give you additional interferon to help with uh, a viral infection. And again, it's basically warning the cells that there's a virus here. Get prepared in case it comes inside of you to be able to destroy it and stop this cycle. So remember, apoptosis, what is that? Program cell death. Do we get inflammation with apoptosis? No, right? This is when our cells are dying in such a way that we're not going to elicit a huge inflammatory response. But phagocytic cells are going to come, right, and clean up these dying cells. Resident macrophages will, will um, help eliminate the, the debris from this these cells that are dying. So our last one was fever. So fever is an increase in our core body temperature, right? We regulate this because maintaining a, uh, an optimum body temperature ensures that our enzymatic reactions happen at the best, under the best possible um, conditions, right? Enzymes are mostly proteins. Proteins are very much affected by changes in temperature, especially heat. If you expose them to too much heat, they're going to coagulate. They're going to deform permanently, what we call denaturing, and they're no longer usable. You would have to remake those proteins. Well, remember, it's enzymes that make proteins, right? So it becomes this vicious cycle, right, of if you destroy proteins, you're not going to be able to recover them. She has that really loud, huh? It's my, one of my Hopefully it's not going to be long. All right, she's good. Okay, good. All right, um, someone close our door might create a little bit more of a buffer for us. So we regulate our body temperature. 
And sometimes with infection, especially bacterial, we will, under our own control, increase our core body temperature. And the reason for that, it's beneficial because our enzymatic reactions will happen a little bit faster with that increase in heat, right? Chemical reactions happen faster with heat. You just got to not get too hot, right? And that's the scary thing and the troubling thing that can happen with fever is that if we get too hot, right, then we start destroying our own um, cellular processes, right, our own cells. But if we can get really hot and impede or kill off bacteria because we're too hot for them, that's a benefit for us. So it, fever is twofold, right? We're going to do things faster because it's warmer, and we're going to maybe even impede the microorganism because it's too hot for them. So cytokines that we produce are pyogens that that's going to signal our body to increase core body temperature. The bad news, though, is that some, especially bacteria, produce their own molecules that are received by our system as fever inducers. Right? These are exogenous pyogens. So these are ones produced by something other than us. So some bacteria produce these pyogens, these fever-inducing compounds, and increase our fever. This is bad news for us because we don't have control anymore, right? Something else is controlling this fever response, this increase in temperature. And that's why a lot of times if you have a prolonged fever that's just is increasing and not going away, this is usually the, the sure sign of bacterial infection and um, Hopefully it doesn't happen at night so you don't end up in the emergency room, right? Um, but anybody who has kids has probably been there at one time or another because that's when fevers seem to spike is at night, <laughs> right? And you find out your kid has a raging ear infection and they didn't complain at all, right? Um, so, uh, but yeah, you know, when that fever isn't going away, go, you know, definitely seek medical attention. Don't keep taking the Tylenol and knocking down that fever, right? Find out what's the source because um, maybe it's probably bacterial, and the good news is we can give you some antibiotics, right, and clear up that infection. Make sense? Right. So although we will respond with fever, some microbes will even, you know, hijack our system, which is bad news for us. So that's it for innate. So remember, study up, especially sometime over this over the weekend. Um, try and do that connect uh, assignment, right, innate, uh, as a quiz. See what you know and what you don't know as it relates to innate immune response. So we're going to go over to adaptive, and because of that, I'm going to... Um,